Thank you all for, um, for coming. Welcome to Grand Rounds. We have a, an incredible honor and opportunity today to learn from Dr. Matthias Zumstein. Dr. Zumstein is, um, was one of the sites on my traveling fellowship in Bern, Switzerland. Um, and he is uh, an incredible thinker and has made already, you know, huge contributions to our field. He was trained by numerous luminaries in our field, including Christian Gerber and Pascal Bolo. Um, and is um, at Bern now, was, was at the university for a while now, and is also in private practice to Sonhoff. Um, and he, uh, he's going to give us two talks, first on PSI navigation and augmented reality, and then a second talk on his journey. And his journey is particularly unique because he was an Olympian in a sport called handball that's more popular in Switzerland than it is here. And the lessons he learned as captain of the handball team for Switzerland and the, the ways in which those in, impacted his old career. It's, it's an incredible opportunity for us to learn from someone of this magnitude, to have him come to our program. So um, I'm hopeful that you'll gain from this opportunity. It's, um, we're incredibly honored to have him here, and we really appreciate him taking some time to come visit us a couple days before the ASAP meeting. So thank you. Welcome. Thank you very much. So thanks, Peter, for the, for the words and the invitation. Oh, great. Of thank course, you. thanks for coming. And so, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Thank you very much for having me. It's an honor and a privilege. Uh, he told me you have to be very uh, good dressed, so wear a tie, wear, um, wear, wear a suit for the grand rounds. The reason why I wear a red tie is not because I want to be a politician. <laughs> it's because uh, it was a present from Peter from the University of Utah. So it's kind of a respect to be here with the present that Peter gave me during his, uh, my fellowship. Anyhow, my person, I come from Bern, which is pretty in the middle of, uh, of, um, of uh, Europe. You see here, I uh, was born there, married two adult daughters, which is so here where we still ski. I'm the head in an academic uh, private setup at the uh, shoulder of an orthopedic sports. I was trained, as Peter said, in Bern, Zurich, with Professor Gordon Nice, and in Adelaide, Australia. These are my disclosures. So I would like to share with you three topics. What do I think? It doesn't need to be right or, uh, what I think, so it's also open to, to discuss this maybe at the end, and to share with you your thoughts. Uh, then what, uh, what do we need to know, what I think we have to know about uh, this topic, and how precise are we with which methods? I think plan is key. I think Benjamin Franklin already said, if you do not plan, you are prepared to fail. So plan is very, very key. And I plan every surgery. Of course, basically an osteosynthesis uh, plate removal or so might be an easier thing to plan. You just calculate the amount of screws. But uh, big planning is uh, planoid and acromion osteotomy. I will quickly share with you this anatomic and reverse total shoulder arthroplasty. This acromion and glenoid osteotomy is a really, really, really new approach because we address the morphological shape of that uh, patient and compare to a statistical shape model and look how we could normalize those patients. And then planning is key. For example, here, this 42-year-old patient with a failed banker, you see that he, this is X-ray before, pretty uh, label tear on the backside, already <laughs> pre-arthritic. And we can do morphologic analysis and to show that the acromion has a completely, let's say, wrong and mal-orientated shape. And we want to correct it and augment it also with a bone block on the back, which is called the Scapinelli operation. Pretty sophisticated and difficult surgery. And without planning, this is impossible and patient-specific instruments. The same in this case, 17-year-old. Recurrent posterior instability with a type C glenoid, as you may see here. And again, here we've done morphologic analysis to a normalized shoulder, and we have to reorient both the chromium and the glenoid in space. And we've done this surgery, losing one of the head of the screws. And uh, this is now him afterwards in terms for the posterior instability, his clinical testing afterwards. And the third is already a pre arthritic patient. 37 years old, you see that the head is completely posterior sublux in the axial view. And you see the morphologic uh, orientation of that glenoid as well as the acromion is completely malorientated. That this is this results after three months where we were able to reorient this B2 uh, glenoid. Anyhow, easier to plan and easier to discuss about this is in anatomic and reverse total shoulder arthroplasty here. 
purple you see the anatomic, green you see the reverse throughout my whole talk. We know that the position of the implant really matters also, and of course in knee and hip surgery, but in shoulder surgery as well, it's very, very crucial to avoid complications, achieve better performances, and have a better functional outcome. And in anatomic total shoulder arthroplasty, we would like to address at the humeral side to reproduce the patient's premorbid anatomy in terms of the height of the head, the inclination of the head, the weak for torsion or version heat, whatever uh, they want in terms of the position, and in the glenoids to have the correct version or inclination. So, in the reverse, we know, and most of you guys know, that the biomechanics change from an anatomic setup to a reverse setup. You medialize and you distalize the center of rotation by changing the anatomy. For those who are not familiar with shoulder and elbow surgery, this is the basic concept. But nowadays, there's a big debate where we should position those implants. Should we go more lateral, more medial? Should we go more distal or more proximal? So this distalization as well as lateralization is key in planning. And what we would like to, to achieve, or what we would like to plan, if we, uh, if we achieve that at the end, it's not 100% uh, sure, but we want to be sure that we've done everything to plan meticulously what we can achieve. So we would like to have the best passive planning range of motion in our planning, and we would like to plan also to potentially obtain the best stable active range of motion. This positioning has an impact on the remaining deltoid muscle, on the remaining cup anterior, the subscapularis, and on the remaining cup posterior, which is usually only the teres minor. So if we discuss the passive range of motion, we can address this planning at the humeral side or at the glenoid side. If we look first at the humeral side, the orientation of this implant is key. So do we have kind of an inlay, semi-inlay, or an onlay uh, model? Or how is our head net shaft angle, the inclination of the liner in the coronal plane? As to, uh, as to show you this, is these three designs. If you have an inlay, that was classic, the original prosthesis, where you show that the whole metaphysial part is within the bone. Then the semi-inlay, where parts it it within the bone and parts outside the bone, or an onlay where the metaphysial part is on the bone, you see. And of course, the more you go from inlay to onlay, the more you lateralize the humerus, the more you have a so-called insertion offset. And this might have an impact on your mobility, because if you have a semi-inlay or an inlay, you have good abduction. Conversely, if you have an onlay, you may impinge on the acromion doing an abduction, a movement that you do in your daily activity. So we assessed it, and not only we've done it, tons of other authors have done the same thing. And we, look, we saw that if we go from an inlay to a semi-inlay, we increase a deduction, so you can have the arm at the rest. And if you, uh, uh, but you, uh, and if you go further more to an onlay, so to more lateralize at the humeral side, you may significantly decrease a deduction, so those patients can more have the arm at the end but have less abduction, so less mobility with the arm in space. If you change the inserter from 155, which was usually originally the case, to 145, you have a better adduction. We already heard this also from the inlay, so you can have a better position of the arm at the space, and you have a better external and internal rotation here. But if you go then further to 135, which is another inclination, it has an impact on uh, abduction, so you have significantly less abduction, you can significantly less abduct the arm, and you have less external rotation too. And our daily activity, come to here, go to the phone, is external rotation too in space. Here it's not so crucial that we can use the arm, but here in space, that's key for us. So I think uh, if uh, we want to go for to have uh, the best let's say, compromise in going in all planes, 145 is the key, especially if we want to use the arm in space. 
So we know now that the best is apparently a so-called semi-inlay concept, the head neck shaft angle from 145, if we want to get all the mobility in space. Then we go to the glenoid side. And the glenoid side, it's years ago already Richard Niefer, he described that the positioning of the implant is key. And if you position that implant, calculating the morphology of the scapula and the positioning of the peg, it's not so important to understand all these parameters. But we can calculate with a sensitivity of 91 and a specificity of 88% that we avoid notching. And if we look to the standard base plate, independent of the company if you used, right, or whatever, uh, company or DGO or Veracle or whatever, if you go at the lower point and you have a two millimeter offset of your implant, you can avoid a notching in up to 93%. And then the next point is lateralization. So how we position our glenoid if we are zero or we lateralize at the bone, four millimeters, or with the glenoid itself, or even more lateralization, and where we position this glenoid, uh, this place plate, central, inferior, or posterior, inferior, rotate. Absolutely key is that you lateralize at least four millimeter in the glenosphere. Whatever technique you use, whatever implant you use, the impact on total range of motion is significant in the first four millimeters lateralization at the glenoid. So the more you lateralize at the glenoid, in all planes, you have a, a significant improvement of the mobility. If you go further on, if you lateralize much more at the glenoid side, you just have an impact, again, on external and internal rotation too, the arm and space, but not really an impact on the other ones. And additionally, if we inferior position it, it has mainly an effect on internal rotation one, which is here the case. So again, if we summarize this passive low range of motion, on the glenoid side, to put it distal is key, and to lateralize at least four millimeter is key. And with all this knowledge, we know that passively we can achieve theoretically the best range of motion in terms of addressing those points. Then we go to this theoretically active glenohumeral range of motion and the impact on the remaining muscles, the deltoid, which is the motor for flexion and abduction and the remaining puff for rotation. And of course, lateralization or medialization is in, has a key in this, uh, in this impact on range of motion and it's pretty obvious that independent of your position you have more or less range of motion, the details are not very important and that's like, and out from Peter from here, from this university, he confirmed the same, the same story that it's dependent on the size. You, you and me, we have not the same size, so we do not have the same parameters, we do not have the same calculations, so we cannot say that every implant and every position of the implant for us is the same. So we have really to address how tall we are, how big is the shoulder, and what are the morphological differences. So he, he has not the same shoulder that she. So that's why we have to think that maybe we should personalize our planning in terms of the remaining tension. And now this is a kind of a, one of the topics that I like to discuss about it because all our, most of our literature is based on calculation in the mean 46 head. Because we know that, for example, he described mean head in our population is 46. But again, I have a different head than you have. We have much different sizes. So if we assume on a 46 head, this is the mean diameter of the curvature. So from here to here, from lateral to medial, 46. And we know that the mean offset, meaning from the center of the diameter towards the center of the stem, you can understand this here C, is 7 millimeters. Huh? So meaning you have an offset from the center of rotation to the center of the stem of 7 millimeters. So the distance from the greater to velocity to the stem, not to the center of rotation, is 16.2. If we calculate our position in our prosthesis, then the difference between here, the bone, and the stem is the half of the center of the distance here, meaning 42 divided 46 divided by 2, mean 23, plus the 7 millimeter offset. So in a 46 head is 30. Pretty clear, pretty obvious. 
But if we again assume that we have different sizes, then in not every person does it 30 just can go up to 34 or even 36, depending on the size. If we assume our calculation here in the 48 head, then we see this number, just keep this number in mind, 31 in the 48 head, meaning individually planned. And then we have to, again to understand what is our humerus, what is our glenoid. The humerus, again, they have different parameters in the glenoid. We have this greater tuberosity, we heard, we have the stem, and then we have this offset to the humeral path, the center of the rotation, to the pivot point, to the glenosphere radius, and of the glenoid bone. It's not important to memorize this. I just want to say that all the different implants, they have a huge range of, uh, of, uh, of this offset. There is a difference up to two centimeters. Remember, 46 had mean, two centimeters difference, almost 50% difference within the implant in a 46 head. So we cannot assume for every implant, for every person, the same calculation. And that's why this great study came out that you have three concepts. Again, we heard it, the inlay, the semi-inlay, or the onlay. And it's not important which which material do you use. You have just to know where you are. For example, I use my implant. I know that it's 9.2 is the humeral offset. Just 9.2 at the end, I should get 31. Remember 48 there. The glenoid side is the same. We can play at the diameter of the sphere, at the lateralization of the sphere, at the base plate, or at the bony, uh, we do a bony augmentation. Here, we could play at different offsets. So the main message here, you have to understand what is the offset of your prosthesis. For mine, prosthesis is 14.3. So again, we have 9.2 at the humeral, 14.3 at the glenoid side. And now we can start to play. Now we can start to play. Because we know, remember 48 head at the beginning, at the end we should have 31. I know it might be a little bit confusing, but the most important message is that you can calculate this distance. You have to know what is your prosthesis, and then you can precisely calculate how much you should medialize and lateralize your, additionally your prosthesis. So now what I need to know, I think it's important that we discussed about the workflow and people who are not maybe very familiar with segmentation and all these planning tools, there might be some interesting thing, thoughts to discuss about it. There are three steps in the workflow if you want to plan a, uh, with a planning software. First is segmentation. Out of 2D images, you create 3D images. This can be done manually, one of the Years ago, when we were residents, we segmented the whole day this bloody, uh, this bloody CT scans. It can be done automatic, or most of the time today, automatic uh, segmentation with manual correction. And you have to know how the segmentation has been done. What is the replication? What is the gold standard? And especially, how accurate is this segmentation? And maybe you heard once this Sorensen and Dice score. It means just how good are you how accurate are you with this segmentation process? Because if I ask, for example, my company, then they say, okay, my Sorens and Dice score for my software is 0.95 with a, such kind of a uh, precision in per, uh, per pixel. Second step is then anatomic landmarks. We get a 3D model, a 3D image, and then we have to pick some anatomic landmarks. This is the acromion, this is the corporate process, this is the inferior super border of the glenoid. And again, there is important to understand how precise are we able or is the software able to, uh, to point, pick these landmarks. And for example, here you see in that, this study, we saw that the posterior corner of the acronym is absolutely not precise. All the rest is quite precise, but this is not precise. So that's why in your planning system, when you start to do a plan also hip or knee, the best would be that you can start to definite, 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 uh, define your points. Here you see, for example, the software calculates here the inferior border of the scapula, which is not really the inferior border. So you should manually define where your point of your planning, uh, of your inferior border of the software is. And you see, this has an impact on the whole planning, on the whole parameters at the end. If we do not define at the end the correct points and the correct anatomic landmarks, we get lost within the planning. 
Because the third point is then the parameters. Also in hip and knees, you have virus, bulgus, you have flexion extension. Same in the shoulder, we have all these cor correlations with our planning, where you want to position your, um, your implant at the end, where according to the parameter which has been defined before. Because inclination and retroversion is key that we know how it is defined. Is it defined at the three Friedman or the trigonum or whatever? And that's not so important that we discuss about the details, but it has an impact on our planning in the anatomic and in the reverse. And this is a lot of work has been done here with Matthias Jacksons here at the University of Utah, where they defined those parameters. The best fit circle uh, ideas come out of this university guidelines for humeral subluxation, either it's in reference to the glenohumeral joint or if it's reference to the scapular humeral joint that came out all here of this work. So it's tremendous to have then an impact on the position in anatomic, in reverse, if you want to augment it with a bone or um, you want to calculate your range of motion and your uh, position on the humerus bone. This, uh, uh, on these uh, calculations. So here, that's why all this workflow, segmentation, point picking, and definition of, of, of uh, parameters has an impact. Because if you have the same patient with these different softwares that are available, there's a huge variability between the system, six to 11 degrees. In, uh, in some of the parameters. So it's really important that you try to understand your software and your definitions before you use it. And additionally, this, all these calculations are not precise. Again, Bob's uh, work in JLS, he, they clearly described that it's so much dependent on other factors than just the glenohumeral motion. Maybe the scapular thoracic is even more key in those. Uh, um, Calculations. You have to understand the time plan. If you want to use a PSI, it will take some weeks. So if we want to do operate this the day after tomorrow, uh, it's not able because the company needs to provide me some guides. And if, for example, if I use navigation, then it's shorter. Within 24 hours, I can do this search. But then how I transferred it to the surgical procedure, very nice, we've done some planning, we could doubt our planning, and now the question is how we transfer our planning into the surgical procedure, and in the shoulder this is key, because we have some problems with that. And you heard about these three options, virtual reality, great for training, because you have really completely a virtual world, where you operate within this virtual world, it's great for education for residents, Augmented reality gives you some information. You have direct feedback during the navigation and or augmented reality of the, with virtual objects, you can augment the real world. And merged or mixed reality is just have a planning and you have the planning in the OR. You have the planning either in a hologram or you have the planning in the out, but you do not have an intraoperative feedback. You don't know if you're correct with your cut. You don't know if you're correct with your KY. And so that's a big, big, big problem. Joe and the old already said that if you have a good planning, and, but you cannot inaccurately transfer, for example, this huge bogus is this planning into the surgical procedure. And two ways to transfer our planning direct in the surgical field are either patient-specific instruments or navigation, maybe with augmented reality. So, and the question is then, the last question, how precise are we with those methods? Are we experimentally very precise or more precise if we have comparable data, or also how we are clinically very or just more precise than what has been reported? There is clear evidence for planning Side, and there is clear evidence for planning as itself. But that's why we wanted to assess this precision, not only on the glenoid, but also on the humeral side. And we've done a cadaveric study where we compared patient specific osteotomies compared to the standard cutting guide group. And we've done an overlay from pre to post operatively, and we assess the parameters, height, inclination, retrotorsion. Again, the first question can we restore? the pre-morbid anatomy of the proximal humerus. And we were able to show that with PSI, even in very experienced shoulder and elbow surgeon, 
we were significantly more precise in the humeral head in terms of height than in terms of radial torsion. The same thing, not with PSI, but with navigation, we wanted to look in the reverse setting. And we, the same methodology, we wanted to assess the deviation between plan, intra, and post operative. So, in terms of inclination, retroversion, entry point, and rotation, we want to look if we are really, uh, if we can execute intra operatively what we plan. And additionally, if we are really as precise as we think during the surgery postoperatively using CT scan. Same methodology, 12 cadavers, we make an overlay pre to postoperatively and we assess those, uh, those uh, parameters. And you see that independent of the parameter from plan to postoperatively, so we were able to reproduce intraoperatively what we plan and we were able postoperatively to be as precise compared to intraoperatively within two degrees or two millimeters in terms of the precision with navigation. This has been confirmed also by other authors. Joaquin from Mayo Clinic recently published this. So it's pretty standard worldwide that the precision in the cadaveric setup is pretty high. There are different, many other surgeons and uh, um, researchers who assess this. So that most of the time we are pretty precise in uh, and reliable and accurate in the cadaveric setup. But now the question is: Are we really clinically and all nice cadavers? We have time; we can do that. Are we clinically precise? And the last but not least, is that effective for the clinical results? Because that's at the end the key. We've done the first study where we looked at the PSA in anatomic and we were able to show that if we were significantly more precise in our setup with 80% precision within 3 millimeters difference of the central rotation feed to post-operatively compared to what is usually been, uh, the, uh, have been described because usually you have great planning but you cannot reproduce this during the surgical procedure as for the group over has described. Also, this in this uh, PSI study, we were able to reproduce this pretty good. Uh, using PSI here, you see the humeral cut, we have a PSI and we uh, uh, precisely can cut torsion, the height and the inclination, and then we do this uh, implantation and we were able to reproduce this pretty clearly. We wanted to do the same then also in the reverse setting using navigation, 42 patients, we had problems at the beginning, for sure. Honestly, if you had no problems at the beginning, then maybe you should be a little bit self-reflective. We had two, twice the fracture of the coracoid because we had uh, to fix it with the pin. We had to change the planning because of a different approach. We had to change this fixation. And we assessed 20 cases, K6 to 26 in this prospective series and wanted to look how precise we are and how long it takes us. The learning curve is pretty steep. At the beginning, we have four minutes to put the tractor on the coracoid. The first 20 cases, the mean tractor time was 3.2 minutes. The registration time was huge if you have to go for a second attempt. 17 minutes, at the end, two minutes. And the total surgical time was uh, decreased from two and a half to one and a half hour in this procedure. If we look to the recent systematic review, uh, you have a mean 12 minutes more surgical time with navigation and you use more augmentations because you intraoperatively assess the orientation very, uh, more accurate. And again, we've done post-operative CT scan compared to the pre-operative CT scan. And again, we compared how precise intraoperatively we were able to reproduce the plan situation. And you see we were a little bit less good in terms of the depth that we were less precise, but the terms inclination, retro, anti-entry point, we were really precise. This has been confirmed also by other authors, which, has, which had similar results. And then the main question, if we think great planning, we've done a great surgery, but then reflective, at six weeks we've done a CT scan, look, are we really as precise as we thought intraoperatively doing a CT scan? And you see, except for retro, version of the glenoid, we were within two degrees and two millimeters in terms of the position and also this one has been confirmed by other authors. So see, intra to post operatively, really precise plan to post operatively, this is the range what we are deviated from the plan 
position. This has been confirmed also by other authors, again, systematic review, that if you, if you navigate, you are more precise for retroversion and inclination. You use augmented glaring component with an odds ratio of 8, and you have a better screw placement and a longer screw hole, but you have a 12-minute surgical time. And now, the most important message so far, no clinical difference. Huge amount of work, huge amount, and if this really has an impact on long longevity and on the uh, survival rate of the prosthesis and the clinical outcome, needs to be proven. It's pretty new technology, of course, the me guys know that for years already, uh, but if this has an impact on clinical significance, it's uh, up to discuss. As a take-home message, I personally think planning is key in every surgery. My main planning, intensive planning, is due for osteotomies and uh, anatomic and reverse total shoulders. Semi inlay and the head neck shaft angle 145 is for the passive range of motion key, especially also to distalize and to minimally lateralize for 4 millimeters to have the all range of motion in all directions. In terms of lateralization, I think. Anatomic side is key to refix the subtype retention of the remaining cuff that you should meticulously calculate and plan your position of your implant and know your implant, what are your offsets of your implant. You have to understand that there may be variabilities in segmentation, in defining anatomical landmarks and also parameters and uh, that there might be huge difference within some softwares uh, for A to B and for the parameters. You know, have to know your time plan in every case and if I can transfer my surgical planning just in the OR to hang a piece of paper on the wall or directly into the surgery using PSI or navigation. In terms of the cadaveric study, we are more accurate with PSI compared to the standard cutting guides. In the reverse setting, we are very accurate within 2 millimeters or 2 degrees. Same in anatomics, significantly more accurate in terms of the positioning of the humeral component with PSI. In the reverse, we are very accurate what we heard, but if this has a clinical difference at the end, we need to prove in the future, and I would like to thank you very much for your attention. Great, uh, amazing talk. Uh, obviously, I think of the residents as well as the other faculty, this is, uh, you know, it's a tremendous amount of work that we've learned here to actually um, Take some concepts that are really in the, 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 the infancy or the shore of lasting and instability and start to actually do research and then take that research and then translate it to the clinical care. So um, it's, it's a really great example of how you can actually make a clinical difference in front of the patients that you're taking care of based upon the research that you're doing. So you know, tremendous job. I had Couple, couple questions. First question I had to you was with regards to your planning, so you know, you're trying to replicate your, your both shoulder placement based upon the amount of lateralization. You are taking measurements based on pre op uh, of utilization or utilization and then trying to model Yes. You're doing that in the morbid case. Yes. Meaning there's already erosion, there's yes. already disease. Do you think that that's accurate, or should we be using the pre-order and replicating the pre-order anatomy as opposed to using the morbid anatomy, where we know that in certain cases there's severe utilization of the language? Yeah. Is, is that what we want? Yeah. So the honest answer is I don't know exactly what we should. What I think yeah. is. We have three different ways of glenoids. Maybe for those which are not very familiar, there are three different ways. What it used to be the glenoid, and then with the erosion, there is a kind of a, especially if you have a biconcave glenoid, you have pre morbid glenoid, you have the so called paleo glenoid originally, and you have the end stage glenoid, and sometimes the head is riding on the end stage glenoid, so it's medialized. I think I personally go 
take in between the palema and the morbid glenoid. I calculate in the middle of the glenoid the central of rotation to lateralize there to the anatomic position. Not assuming the palo glenoid is my key, because with the erosion, I think it's too tight at the end. If I go to the morbid glenoid, which is completely mandialized, I won't be able to restore the anatomy, I guess. So I go in the middle of this of these two. I don't can tell you the answer whether I'm right or wrong, it's just what I think. What do you think? Um, yeah, so I I'm a little bit different in terms of how I I take the morbid level. Yes. But then I presume that there's some amount of lateralization and distillization that I need to achieve as opposed to trying to exact, exactly replicate what the in between in between the, the pre morbid state and the disease state. Yeah. So it's it's somewhat coming to the same conclusion that I'm not putting it at the pre morbid state, yeah. but the amount of lateralization or distillization is is a more fixed range as opposed to being uh, specific to the actual. So I think we need to lateralize uh, somewhere between two to seven millimeters, yep. uh, which is honestly fairly comparable. Yes. Yeah. 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 I mean, as if, as you know, I'm a little bit nerd regarding that. That looks for you really nerdy. I can understand that, but it's kind of a start to think and discuss with the resident and the fellows the case is that they understand why we go in that way, and not just say rule of thumb, three, five, seven. Of course, at the end, it's always between 3 to 7, as you said. We end up at the same calculation. So you have to transfer this to the education that the people understand what the thoughts and what, what's going on with, with your patient and with your implant. Because your implant is different than mine. So at the end, we should come up at the same point. Second question. Um, how many questions? Is from your last study that you had, yes. which was looking at the the uh, accuracy with regards to intraoperative navigation. Yes. Did you compare that to planning, i.e., if you just did the plan and tried to replicate the plan without the operation? Yes, so a comparable group. Correct. Yeah, but we didn't have the, we didn't make that, we didn't have CT scan for that on a regular basis after six weeks. That was not the uh, Problem of the admission that we didn't stand, we were not able to do that. We were just able to do CT scan. And I think if we calculate this instead of X ray, the variability of position is too low. So, answer is not yet, but I will not be able to do that. The reason I bring this up is because so we did this yeah. a series of navigations to view that we used in navigation, we used PSI guys. Yeah, doesn't matter. And then we also compared that. So that we were within a couple of degrees of the plan versus the You see that, Robert? Sure. Sure. Yeah, we found, so we did almost an identical study. What was done here? We said instead of using intraoperative navigation, which is using fixed points of scapula and we're using this kind of plan here, the guy instead. It's been created before. And then over here, we compare that to we just planned it more. So we grab it with the engine using the same methodology that we didn't have the PSI guy just created. And then use the, the plan conditions in the model. So I'm trying to replicate the position that we can be in just by looking at the visual images that we were within two or three degrees. It was just in this series of shows. So you and Peter are really good yes. Just ask the key. Well, you'd rather I have you guys. Yeah, I'm not going to ask the key. Yeah, I'm not going to ask the The last part was whether or not it's going to be important. Right, it may not but it better be well. In trouble with salt to get absolutely. So that's why I think it's just putting them in. Four of them say, well, at least half of them are in that situation. What was really interesting in those studies which you mentioned is the standard cut was PSI. You know who operated in those cases. Beside me, there were two brilliant children, technically, probably one of the best. Pretty good, it's all research, but it's all technically. 
and even he was significantly more precise in reproducing the cuts on the humerus. On the humerus. Yeah. So even a brand new experience showed at the, the Florian group of study was changed in one. And he was not able to replicate his climate in 65% of the cases. He created about the climate in the OR and he cut the code the climate that he saw on the screen, uh, uh, on the wall, and he was not able to replicate within 3 millimeters in 65 cases. So I know you were a brilliant search, and I absolutely want to emphasize that. But I think the regular shoulder is not able to replicate. But I, what I'm saying is that I think part of it is I think the humorous thing about how they and so, in, in a sense, um, we have even shown this. So, we did, you know, where you have cuts of the proximal humerus. Our application of the humerus was we get, you know, cases that were four or five millimeters and were stuffed, and et cetera. And so, their variability at the humerus to bring that. And so, I think light precision in being able to replicate the proximal humerus in a final part of plastic is less than if we can see. Even with a plant, as opposed to a blunt one in a reverse shoulder, this was the planning was to be So I would be interested to see if it would be great if you could do the same study back with planning with LTSI to see what you are yeah. in and compare it to that. Can I ask you, I, I, so just for the residents, this, I mean, it's a brilliant talk. And the thing that's so brilliant about it is all of the work and thinking you've done about. How many millimeters here and there, and a fully shows the residents like just the depth of thought that goes into an operation where you're not necessarily trying to restore the native anatomy. You have to put it in a prosthesis. And that's so much of what we do in orthopedics is put it in prosthesis. One of the questions I have for you is: You laid out so beautifully millimeters. It has to be you know this many millimeters that way, this many millimeters that way, this way. Does your plan alter depending on the status of the soft tissues? You know, in this case, we do reverses for going to humeral osteoarthritis, yeah. where there's an intact infraspinatus. And we do do reverses for patients with rotated cuff carapathy, who frequently do not have an intact infraspinatus. Yeah. So many people in this country say you should lateralize more yeah. for the cuff carapathy patient than for the osteoarthritic patient. Certainly, that's something our fellow at Lorcan is thoughts that he learned with that jaw. Yeah. What, what are your thoughts on Absolutely agree. I mean, it would be more even more complicated if I put this <laughs> also because it's already complicated enough for most of the people, I think. No, absolutely agree. If you have, for example, a fractured sequela, if you have a fractured patient that then you have a call up and you have a uh, of the tetan and you will reverse it, that's a narrow, difficult surgery where you have no space, everything is called, everything, same with the osteotritis in the type G or the B2, that's a narrow situation compared to a standard cuff or atrophy where you know, everything opens up by itself. So I changed my plan and if I had a fractured sequela and osteotritis, I'd take, tend to go for less lateralization, but I cannot quantitatively completely assess it. Then I'm going to play with two to three millimeters less lateralization. And I just say, that's not the holy grail. My only intention is that I can exchange in my teaching to discuss with the people the case and they, we discuss about the same. Because Bob and I, when we discussed, uh, remember my end, we discussed about lateralization, visualization. I think the people, they watch at us and say, those guys, they are. Yeah, they, they discuss a way which, uh, uh, we agree that Maybe we cannot reproduce this one, but we thought so much about it that maybe if we have an issue during the surgery, we could address this uh, easy, more easily or, uh, than, than if we never thought about it. The second thing I want to say, just to make sure the residents understand the, the, the importance of the first part that you discussed, is so that it's well understood now that hip lost your a lot of it comes from dysplasia, right? And it's, as you see with our plastic surgeons, their grass style osteotomy is like a big part of their practice. There is there currently in trauma surgery is no role for a perioclinic osteotomy. The PAO was originally called the Bernice osteotomy because it was a bit <coughs> yeah. And you're witnessing the birth of the same thing in children. So I think that there's a strong argument made that this is the beginning of a change in shoulder, but we'll see. Exactly, that's the intention. I was trained with Gauss and Gerber, so Gauss trained with Gerber's impingement that originally came from Gerber. And so we were hit it every morning to say, hey, why? 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 Don't treat us and try to find out the origin. 
Of course, you can do a total hip, but find out why you have an osteotrichic. And, so, and so the shoulder was the same. Christian Gerber, every time, why this bloody osteotrichic occurs? Because we do not understand. I don't tell me understand. We discussed it this morning as well. But we try to go in the same direction to understand the pathology. That's a little bit the thing which I would like then to address in the second talk. The balance between strategy and philosophy. Because now we are in a philosophy. The strategy is to reduce our ideas to a hypothesis. We want to solve a problem. Find out by research to win a hypothesis. Yes or no, correct or not correct. But thinking about philosophy of things which we do not understand. We do not understand the problem of closely. At least I do not understand. If you think it fits the labor on the backside and solve the problem, we know that it doesn't, it doesn't work. The same for many other primary osteotritis. We do not understand primary osteotritis in the shoulders. In the hip, I think there might be some issues. There is impingement with dysplasia. But I think this is, especially for young residents, to find the balance. Of course, you have to do the classic strategy, hypothesis, research, blah, blah, blah. But always do a step back and think about philosophical. Why? Why I should go this way? Does it really solve this, what I do here, clinical problem? Let's stay here on the sort of same life that Peter is on the RFI subscriptions here. Great. Uh, to to echo Peter's thoughts about you know shoulders sort of falling behind where hip and neuroplasty was. I'd say where we're at in hip and neuroplasty now is saying, does technology matter at all? Right? Yeah. I mean, so we tried TSI, it couldn't work very well. We've done navigation, it didn't work very well. We're now in this revive phase. And everybody's super excited about robotics, but now as we get 10 years into robotics and we look at registry data in the hands of the general practitioners, we're still not, we're trying really hard to find some place that says this actually helps us. And, you know, I think it's also from an educational standpoint, can be detrimental. I think planning stuff is really important for residents it's really great to have a pre planned case and think about it in that. But does it really matter long term? And nothing has really worn out in the industry yet to, to make us you know, really that compelling to use it. And you know, industry is pushing all kinds of this stuff because, man, they make a hundred million bucks on every robot they can sell. Yet we haven't really been able to bear out any true clinical benefits. So, you know, and I wonder some about an educational standpoint, too, for one of the surgeons are only trained on this technology. Are you ever going to get surgeons like Bob or yourselves who could do it manually and execute very precisely? It's a robot fall apart, or the power goes out, or you're in a place where you just can't work in your head. Absolutely, thank you for this comment. It's absolutely peaceful. I've done this and I try not to be commercially too much advice, but I've done this and the other stuff for is now I think navigation only in really exceptional, yeah. horrible cases. But to understand the navigation, I have to learn the navigation in standard cases. So from my understanding, what is clear with me that the navigation is more precise than it doesn't have an impact on the cloud. That's my understanding. And I'm pretty sure that in shoulder we will end up at the same point. But we have some cases which which navigation is really, really helpful for me as well. And I'm really happy for this comment because I absolutely agree that we are so much driven by companies and so much driven by these commercial ideas behind it. But uh, that's why I just want to show that I can reproduce what I like to plan. It's not really the most appropriate business feasible. Absolutely, no clinical safety certificates. Uh, my day activity to use that navigation at all in case, no. Yeah. But it's maybe better at shoulder surgery than planning and thinking about this. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. 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 Think, think, yeah. or yeah. think. Yes. So, the interesting thing about your comment, which I think is that, um, that probably in the breadth of all the development that's occurred from a technological standpoint, our capacity to introduce shoulder surgery. You took it probably in aggregate, probably you're right. It hasn't made a difference. Because there's been a lot of things that have been developed that probably don't push the needs at all. But one of the things that I do think has is planning. So there's a piece of a lot of what has been created, which is planning, which probably has made a large difference in our ability to not make large errors for <coughs> single patients, which is valuable. But there's a lot of also noise, you know what I mean, that's also been created over the past 30 years that probably hasn't made any difference at all. And the problem is that I don't think you can pick and choose out some of those 
without getting lost to the, the other noise that occurs in the process. different story and we should include these thoughts also in our planning then it starts to become on a level which I think is much even much more complex which we discussed when we discussed about planning but most of the people so far have no data that's why you are we have your great uh, simulated and I think we have to learn as well as we, we, we learn from the hip which was then much easier because it was static in the pain incidents and all these issues but we will have that as well with the shoulder. But the problem is, it's pretty stable for how the kids is and the, the, the position of the hips and the pelvis that go through this bank. And we have a scattered grass in motion. So that's not, but, but it's pretty hard to reproduce it, but absolutely agree that this is the next level. So do you see a, a role for the down the kids and having them to the extent possible precondition? Yeah. I know we discussed this yesterday. The problem is that the variability within the patients is so high that we have to extensively work with that. Absolutely, I see the goal, but to understand really which ones can cope with, with which morbidity, that's not the dimension for, for us. Yes, please. Um, thank you for a great talk. Uh, it was only the first two slides of your talk, but I was very interested by the, uh, the, the, the acromial osteotomy. <laughs> Um, you mentioned you use the statistical shape model. Yes. Uh, uh, can you decide what morphology from your statistical shape model to use as the correct one in the one Yes. Correct. Yeah, so we have three, maybe, I think, shoulder paradigm, we have three problems. We have crop tears, we have instability, we have also some of them are. And we have a shape model of patients which we, which we know that they have shown. Although two years later on, we call them from the trauma gap if they have uh, no shoulder pathology. Additionally, we call the Cassidy tendinitis patient, who we call them by the if they have a shoulder issue. And that was, and we have a crack brain crack analysis that they did have a crack in the stability of not their brain. So I think absolute clear control and the shape of it is the issue of the data behind this key. But from my understanding, that was the best that we can get to get a control group which has needed one of these three Thank you. Yes, please. Yeah, there's no other 